Hello, the second lesson for week four of the American Revolution Turning Points. Very important one, I think. And honestly, we could just make a whole class on the people of the American Revolution. And so our focus is, how is this possible? And to do that, we have to look at individual groups of people. It's We talk a lot about George Washington. We talk a lot about Continental Congress or King George III and, and Cornwallis and Gates. And those are the big people, the big names. But what about the thousands of everyday people who were part of that revolution? We can't ignore them. So again, if we want to talk about how American colonists became an American independent nation, we have to look at who those people were. And what would you expect to see as far as the different type of people in the Continental Army and part of the revolution, because not all of them were enlisted. So we have to start, of course, with the British side. We have King George III, who is going to be the king throughout the American Revolution. In fact, he is the king from the French and Indian War into the different Stamp Acts, the Sugar Acts, the Townshend Acts, the Tea Act, all of those taxes that became causes of the revolution. King George is along for there. And then he's also going to be there at the end of the war and, and continuing on. All right, we have Lord Cornwallis, who is going to be the leader of the British Army. So, of course, he's going to have many people under him, but he's going to be present at the surrender. He's going to be the key figure throughout all of um, the revolution from the beginning to the end for the British. All right, and then we're going to have lots of loyalists people who were colonists, who lived in the 13 colonies and felt that they were going to take the side of their king, their government, their country. Some of these people had been born in England. Some of these people just felt that the taxes weren't great, but it was expected. Everyone pays taxes no matter where you live. And so they didn't see it as reason enough to rebel. And so you're going to have people from women and men, and you're going to have enslaved people, you're going to have Native Americans that are going to join the Loyalist cause. And so this becomes a big dividing point with Native Americans on which side will they choose. And for the most part, I've mentioned this in other videos, for the most part, Native Americans did side with the British. They felt that the British had been more honorable to government in granting them the land in the Ohio River Valley, in protecting them from colonies, uh, colonists who are wanting to move over into their territories and their land. So they felt that they would strike a better bargain, a better treaty deal with the British. Um, obviously, they didn't want a war at all in their homeland, but if you're going to choose size, most of them went with the British. You also have enslaved people who are promised by the British Army that they will be guaranteed their freedom. Come fight with us and you will be given your freedom. And we'll talk more about that in next week's lesson, what happened to them. But actually, so many enslaved people said, heck, yes, this is my chance to get out of slavery. And they actually closed off the numbers after a while because they just had so many people who were trying to join in. Then you have your everyday families. And some of those everyday families are actually going to be pushed out of their towns. They're going to find refuge in Canada uh, because they are really shunned by towns that are mostly made up of patriots. So you're going to find that, especially in the low country of South Carolina, Georgia, you're going to, along the coastline, you're going to find people that were more supportive of the British crown. That's where a lot of their business was coming from. You're going to see that in the Midlands of North Carolina and again on the, along on the coastline, Virginia, you're going to have a lot of uh, loyalists. And then you're going to have them, of course, throughout the rest of the colonies. All right. And so a loyalist was also known as a Tory. Now, the way I remember who, which side the loyalists were on, loyal rhymes with royals. And about 30%. About a third of the colonists were loyal to the British. And we're going to talk next week. What happens then? What happens at the end of the war, if you were loyal to the British crown, where do you go? What do you decide to do? And that'll be part of next week's discussion. All right, let's look at the colonial supporters. All right, in the New England area, um, 
we'll just work our way down. That's where the revolution starts, right? The bridge of Concord here. We have the Sons of Liberty, which is then going to spread throughout the rest of the colony. Daughters of Liberty, women were boycotting. Women were coming up with substitutions for tea and other items and paper goods and, and making do during these boycotts. Paul Revere, we've talked about. John Adams, who's going to go on to be a president. He's going to be an ambassador during the American Revolution. The local militia, the local, which is now um, called the State National Guard, the people who are going to stay in near their homes to protect their lands, but also hike and travel to fight when needed. Right. Um, it's the militia who start the American Revolution. They're the ones that are going to be at Lexington and Concord. Um, and the individuals were known as the Minutemen. They trained to be ready in a minute. These were your local farmers. Now, I have a star next to the Rhode Island Regiment because they're a very key regiment. They're going to be there from the beginning to the end. They're going to be at Yorktown. They're there at Trenton with Washington. They're going to be at Valley Forge. Okay. This is a mixed unit. This is a unit of whoops, enslaved people, formerly enslaved, some are free, um, some are mixed with Native Americans, some are going to be Native Americans. This was truly a mixed regimental unit, and you see their uniforms were mostly white. They have a hat with an anchor. Anchor is a symbol of Rhode Island for hope, and so they're going to be in the American Revolution from the beginning to end, a very, very key regiment. Uh, it's just really becoming now that we're seeing more information about them. But there's a, a lot of people who st stuck throughout the whole war and um, really some interesting personal stories. All right, so to go back a minute on the slides here. So these are some stamps that were created for the bicentennial in 1976. The American militia, which again, had been there from the beginning. They were started with the first colonies to protect the local small villages, these little towns that were being built from Native Americans who were trying to protest and push them out. And up along in New England, it would have been protests from the French also competing for the land. And then local militia in Georgia looking to buffer from the Spanish. And again, they're now known as the State National Guardsmen. All right, Nathaniel Green, we're going to talk about. He comes from Rhode Island. Um, here he is on the boat with Washington crossing the Delaware. So again, that Rhode Island regiment, it may be the smallest state, but it's a key part of the American Revolution. All right, here, uh, Major General Nathaniel Green, we'll talk about again later. All right, if we're looking at the middle colonies, Right, the Continental Congress set up in the middle colonies. Right, we have the battles of Saratoga and Trenton. We have the Battle of Brooklyn, where Washington retreated, and the British held on to New York City and they held on to the port of Philadelphia throughout the revolution. So those were key points. We see Alexander Hamilton, who is going to be in New York at the time. He's part of the local militia. He later enlists and joins up with George Washington, becoming a secretary, and he's going to lead one of the major uh, battles on the redoubts with General Laf Lafayette and the siege of Yorktown. Benjamin Franklin, who never fights in the war, but helps to draft the American uh, Declaration of Independence and goes on to be an ambassador to France and the Netherlands during the revolution. All right, and then uh, Sybil Ludington. So in our class notes. I have a separate video on Sybil Ludington, and she was a 16-year-old girl from New York State, well, colony at the time, who rode to warn the local people also of British arriving. So, so many people know the story of Paul Revere, but he's one of many people who risked their life to go out and go through the night and warn the local militia of British troops that were arriving. All right, and so if we look at the Southern Campaign, Right. Um, with the Southern, who's coming from the Southern colonies, we have George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, a uh, large number of enslaved people, whether, um, like I said, a lot of them joined up with the British Army for good reason. They were promised their freedom. Some are going to move to join with the Continental Army or the local militia. Right. And in the Southern campaign, in the fighting at Yorktown, 
and the battles that lead up to Yorktown. We see General Nathaniel Green again, Daniel Morgan, who's going to be at the Battle of Cowpens and also going to go up north, uh, Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, and his men who harass and uh, inter- get information from the British in- throughout South Carolina. Uh, James Armistead, I have a separate video again on him in the classroom. And James Armistead adopts the name Lafayette. He becomes a trusted spy uh, for the Continental Army, specifically General Lafayette, who's from France. And he actually ends up working as a double spy uh, for the British, but he's actually giving them mixed messages from Lafayette. So Lafayette knows that the British think he's a spy for them. And uh, without him, there probably would have been more battles lost. And I don't know if Yorktown would have been the success it was. So James Armistead in the video, it says he was refused his freedom. He was a refused pay as a soldier because he was considered only a spy. And, and so Lafayette writes for the Virginia legislature um, where James lives and he is back as a slave. He's enslaved again following the revolution, and he's granted his freedom. He adopts uh, Lafayette's name as his last name and goes on to own some farmland and be an independent man. He's just one of so many stories. There's Samuel Poor, there's um, Peter Salem, and there's so many individual names, but unfortunately so many of the stories are stories we can get by looking at the actual documents of who was paid and we can look at it from other soldier stories but a lot of these men especially um, black men or native american men and women didn't write their stories many of them couldn't read or write and so they didn't write their stories and so a lot of their stories are lost sadly so right so the women um we have women like abigail adams who is John Adams' wife, and John Adams takes his nine-year-old son and goes across uh, on this terrible ship uh, voyage. Well, there was many naval battles. We don't talk about the naval battles, but there was a lot of ships sunk, a lot of fighting out on the Atlantic Ocean, and he arrives in England. He goes to, uh, excuse me, not England, Europe. He goes to the Netherlands, and he tries to get money, tries to get them to help with an alliance. He visits with Benjamin Franklin in France. And so they're doing their work behind the scenes as ambassadors, getting people like General von Steubing to come over. Um, uh, Kazimir Pulaski, who is going to basically develop the American cavalry, uh, a Polish officer who's going to come over and fight. And so Abigail Adams stays home and runs the farm in Boston, Massachusetts. You have Martha Washington, who follows George Washington, especially in the winter times, follows him around, leaves her two children at home and follows him around. Many of the officers' wives especially did that. Um, we have Polly Cooper, who's a statue of here, an Ida woman, who helped out at Valley Forge. And legend is that Martha Washington gave her a, one of her shawls. We have, I, there's no images of them, but George Washington had a staff and many of the staff came from his plantation in Mount Vernon and slave people um, that worked for him and kept house for him and cooked for him. And we have Phyllis Wheatley in the engraving there who was a young girl and slave girl living in Boston, Massachusetts. And her, the family that she was enslaved by realized how bright she was and actually had her poems published. And she became a great supporter of George Washington. And one of her poems was written about George Washington. Um, and again, ironically, she was enslaved and Washington is fighting for freedom, which is something that we often talk about with the American Revolution. You know, who were the people that were in that we the people, right? And these are stamps that, come, that came, were created for 1976 for the 200th anniversary of uh, Declaration of Independence. And I like these because they show you the variety of jobs that were needed. You needed seamstresses to sew the uniforms, sew the flags, right? Cobblers. You need the local militia. You need a blacksmith. You need coopers. Uh, 
you know, you have horses, you have wagons, you need barrels for food, you need tents. There's so much that you need. You need people chopping down wood, um, medical needs, uh, food needs. There's just so much, right? And so women supported the war in a multitude of ways. In fact, there were even some children in the camps, right? And even if you were a woman who didn't follow your husband into war, you were like Abigail Adams and you were staying home and you were minding your children, you were keeping your farm running and you were doing it as the leader of the home, which was very untraditional at that time, right? You're left to your own devices. Um, of course, the Minutemen were basically the key of the revolution, they're the people that really started out, those Sons of Liberties, the people who decide to band together before there's even an army, right? Um, so again, you have blacksmiths, wheelwrights, all those craftsmen, right, that were critical to the war. You have the French who sent soldiers and ships and supplies. You have the Dutch who sent money to help. And there are so many people that were involved. It's not just the few key uh, generals that we talk about or the Continental Congress or the British Parliament, but it's really the thousands of people that were involved throughout the American Revolution and that were affected by the American Revolution. So in the classroom, there's some forms. Um, there's some questions that you might want to answer. You, you're not required to answer them, but feel free. And there's some extra videos that highlight some of the different groups of people. All right. And next week, we will talk about the Treaty of Paris and what it took to get from the Battle of Yorktown in 1781 to the signing of the treaty that's the official end of the American Revolution.